We've already discussed a little bit about what instructional design is and why we might consider a pursuit of some of the inner workings of the process. We've acknowledged that taking a systematic approach to this pursuit might be of benefit. We've also looked at the major components of the instructional design model known as ADDIE. Let's start to dig a little deeper and get into the ADDIE model. One way to look at the ADDIE model is to look at the many different instructional design models and approaches that have emerged and are being used today. While the list is exhaustive, we can talk a little more generally as to the different types of models that have taken shape and are being used by individuals, teams, and organizations. Let's do a quick flyover of some of these different types of models with the hope that this cursory view will help us better understand the ADDIE model, which we will use to develop our own products. Let's start with some terms that often get used interchangeably. Those are instructional system, learning environment, and instructional system design, or ISD for short. Generally speaking, these terms get mixed, matched, and even overused. But if we think in terms of taking on instructional design from a practical and informed perspective, and we do this in an intentional way, then we might simply contend that instructional design is attempting to answer these three questions. Where are we going? How will we get there? And how will we know when we've arrived? We are going to spend most of our time during this course around the ADDIE model of instructional design. It is shown here. I introduced you to these major steps in the ADDIE process in the previous lecture, so I'm not going to rehash these five steps. You can see these five major steps here. We are going to examine deep into all of these steps throughout the course. For today, I'd like you to consider the ADDIE model as the most generic of the models with five major phases. I'd also like to encourage you to consider how the derivative models that we'll see in these other forms have sometimes built or improved on the ADDIE model, created customized versions of ADDIE, or totally deviated from ADDIE. For all of these different models, we'll want to ask why. As the ADDIE model matured, more general models began to take shape. Some began to add on to the ADDIE model and create their own. In this example, we see the Dick and Carey model of instructional design. The key part of this model that Dick and Carey attempted to address was identifying more granularity in all phases of the model and making more clear the nature of a revision process. Dick and Carey's model is just one example of a model which took the ADDIE model and built on it. Let's call these types of models general models of ID. With time, designers found that ADDIE and other general models often presented somewhat of a rigid structure to the design process, and some could not adapt their work to those more general models. They found a need to transform the general models into approaches, which were more geared to their own organization. Thus, situated models of instructional design took shape. These types of models consider the situation in which the design process is going to take place, and they modified and customized their model accordingly. Here we see one example of what a situated model of instructional design might look like. At the same time this situated approach to instructional design was taking place, designers were finding that the rigidness of early models did not allow for a timely implementation of instruction. Designers also recognized that for some projects, not all steps or not all parts of the steps of the ID process were necessary. For these reasons, designers called for a more rapid approach to the design process. And so emerged rapid models of ID. With these rapid models, three main questions are often asked. How can we do things faster? What can we skip in the design process? And what had we better not skip in the design process? This rapid approach and models for it 
often stayed close to the traditional ante approach, but did not require the phases in the process to be strictly adhered to. Finally, in more recent years, we've seen two additional ID models take shape. Some began to approach the instructional design process by looking directly at the problem and starting with the problem itself. With this type of approach, we bring the problem or main objective to the center and work our way through the process out from the center. Often we hear of these models sometimes referred to as whole task models or working through the ID process using a backward design approach. Finally, it should be noted that while the instructional design field began to grow, the software development field was maturing at the same time. With software development, developers would take a very systematic approach to development and would also allow for speed and adaptations or prototypes of systems to go live and be used before they would be considered fully complete. With this approach, products were brought to the end user quicker and end user feedback could be better incorporated into the product to make them better. In this systems development field, development could become very costly and poor results could easily be delivered. So the software development field took time to develop models, which address speed and usability. Technology and systems were beginning to be used into the field of instruction, and it didn't take long for software development professionals to be working with instructional professionals and traditional ID models collided with software development models. Hybrids of both models began to take shape and we started to see models such as the successive approximation model, or SAM for short, come to fruition. Here we see an example of the SAM model. As we can see with all of these different types of instructional design models, there is no one-size-fits-all or one single solution when it comes to using a model for instructional design. I suggest that it all depends on many different variables, including who's involved, what's the culture of the development environment, what are the resources, and what is the right fit. At the end of the day, I believe if you consider the three questions of where are we going, how will we get there? And how will we know when we've arrived? And you choose to use a model, you will be more likely to be successful and you will likely complete your efforts in a more timely fashion, as well as using your resources more efficiently. For our course, we will approach our work with the most generic approach using the Eddy model. I believe by starting an exploration in the field of instructional design makes the most sense if we take this generic model to lay the foundation for designing instruction and recognize where the field has gone and how we might consider changes and improvements in our own models as we take a more reasoned approach to designing and developing instruction.